a man who influenced the most important presidential administration in American history. A man who led the country into the largest land purchase since the Jefferson administration, and a man whose story would go unappreciated for generations to follow. William Henry Seward was born on May 16th of 1801 in Florida, New York. His father Samuel Seward was a trusted man in Florida with a well-rounded personality. He encouraged young William to pursue an education and develop his potential. Like many families of New York at the time, the Seward family owned several slaves. However, the Seward family was unusual in the fact that they allowed their slaves' children to go to school. William Seward described his father as having never uttered an expression that could tend to make me think that the Negro was inferior to the white person. These ideals that Samuel Seward instilled in his son would end up shaping his moral values and influencing his political life. Young William would grow up to graduate from Union College at the age of 19, studying law and establishing his first law practice in Auburn, New York. While in Auburn, he dedicated much of his time to defending runaway slaves. He also housed runaway slaves in the Underground Railroad, where he became close with Harriet Tubman. Seward became instrumental in Tubman establishing residence in Auburn, where she remained for 60 years. Seward ran for New York State Assembly as a Whig, where he served from 1830 to 1834. Seward then set his eyes on the governorship, which he campaigned for in 1838. During his governorship, he played a major role in the establishment of the New York State public school system, saying, This great work is practicable for us to accomplish, and herein it is that great distinction of our lot over all preceding republics and all other states. Abolitionism proved to be his greatest political agenda. Seward had witnessed the evils of slavery firsthand on a trip to Georgia at the age of 19. His position against slavery would remain fervent in his governorship and the remainder of his political career. In 1846, he stated, Commerce and political power, as well as military strength, can never permanently reside on this continent, in a community where slavery exists. Seward was a true leader, as he sought to represent every American, not just those who had a voice. His devotion to African Americans and their plight never dimmed, and his vision of a free America was never forgotten. Seward was devastated by the loss of his re-election for a third term in office, and returned to his law practice in disgrace. Contrary to his woes at the time, his political life was far from over. In 1849, Seward was elected by the New York State Assembly to serve in the U.S. Senate. Seward stepped right up to the plate, proving that a true leader is persistent and chooses not to let their aspirations die. Seward's time in the Senate would gain him influence and acknowledgement on a national scale. While in the Senate, he took a strong position against the Compromise of 1850, and on March 11, 1850, he addressed the Senate, saying, It is insisted that the admission of California shall be intended by a compromise of question which have arisen out of slavery. I am opposed to any such compromise in any and all forms in which it has been proposed. He also took a position against the Kansas-Nebraska Act, seeing it as a direct attack on abolitionism. He spoke out to the pro-slavery senator, saying, Come on then, gentlemen of the slave states. Since there was no escape in your challenge, we accept it in the name of freedom. Seward was leading the country into an age of abolitionism, refusing to give up on his principles. Seward expressed his political alignment with the Republican Party in 1855. Seward's irrepressible conflict speech became controversial and gained him national prominence. In this speech, Seward denounced slavery by saying, the slave system is one of constant danger, distrust, suspicion, and watchfulness, and commented on the future of the Union by saying, It is an irrepressible conflict between opposing and enduring forces, and it means the United States must and will, sooner or later, become either entirely a slaveholding nation or entirely a free labor nation. Seward had the foresight to know that the Civil War was inevitable. It was no surprise that Seward ran for the Republican nomination, and many Republicans expected him to win. Devastatingly for Seward, Lincoln proved to be the top choice of the convention. Though disheartened by being overlooked by voters, Seward still heeded the call to public service by later accepting Lincoln's nomination for Secretary of State. Seward initially had trouble lowering himself beneath any authority figure, but he eventually swallowed his pride, realizing that in order to lead a greater movement, he must first follow the commands the of the president. Between Seward and Lincoln, they were very close. Uh, they, they really were, although in the beginning, uh, Seward, uh, obviously thinking that he perhaps should have had the nomination, and if he had, he would have. Uh, won the presidency. As Secretary of State, Seward dealt with the British extensively. He had the difficult task of smoothing over the Trent Affair, in which Confederate foreign ministers headed towards London on a British ship were intercepted and indefinitely imprisoned in Boston. In the eyes of the British, this Union intervention undermined Britain's ability to conduct fair and just diplomacy. Through skillful persuasion, Seward was able to deal with the British diplomats, convincing them that the Confederacy's claim to independence was illegitimate. It was because of Seward's action that the Confederacy was not recognized, which prevented the Confederates from gaining international trading rights and foreign military assistance. 
Seward prevented what could have been the biggest disaster upon American diplomacy during the war, thereby solidifying the Union's dominance over the South. Continuing to demonstrate his foreign policy skills, Seward heavily influenced the French withdrawal from Mexico. The French had invaded Mexico in 1863 under the justification that the Mexicans had overdue loans. They established a puppet government under Archduke Fernando Maximilian, also known as Napoleon II. Seward was a strong supporter of the Monroe Doctrine and believed that America should be the only superpower to inhabit the Western Hemisphere. France was violating Mexico's sovereignty as an independent nation, and clearly violating America's request to stay out of Western affairs. Seward put pressure on the French following the end of the Civil War, leading to their full withdrawal from Mexico in 1867. Mexico nearly lost its independence, but with pressure from Seward, foreign nations were forced to abandon their ambitions for Mexico. Lincoln's politics were also heavily influenced by Seward, who had become his good friend and trusted ally. After all, it was Seward who convinced Lincoln to withhold his delivery of the Emancipation Proclamation until the major Union victory had been won. Lincoln's main platform for the war was set in a letter that Seward wrote to Lincoln, suggesting that Lincoln changed the question before the public from one upon slavery or about slavery for a question of upon union or disunion. Some of Lincoln's greatest political decisions were based off the suggestions of Seward. April 14th of 1865 marked the day of the most infamous assassination plot in American history, in which conspirators plotted to kill the top three officials in the U.S. government, President Lincoln, Vice President Johnson, and Secretary of State Seward. While President Lincoln's assassination attempt was successful, Vice President Johnson's assassin abandoned their plot last minute. Lewis Powell was to be the assassin of Seward that night, but through a circle of luck, Seward survived the malicious attack. He had recently been in a carriage accident, leaving him bedridden with large metal plates surrounding his head and chest. The assassin's knife was unable to pierce the metal plates, leading him to abandon his attempt. Seward was severely scarred from this attack, but recovered and got back to work. After the Lincoln assassination, Vice President Andrew Johnson took office. This had doubtful support, as Johnson was not popular among voters and was a southerner by birth. Johnson had a peppery personality, he really did. Uh, he would go around and give speeches and he didn't mind insulting people or insulting language. In 1867, Seward began his biggest political move as Secretary of State, the Purchase of Alaska. Alaska was owned by the Russians who had made offers in the past. Seward was interested in acquiring Alaska and led the arrangements of the meeting in 1867. In March of 1867, an agreement was signed with the Russians selling Alaska for $7.2 million, amounting to about two cents per acre for an area more than twice the size of Texas. Seward met much resistance in this ambition. The agreement only passed in the Senate by one vote, and Seward met much political mockery. The Alaska Purchase was often called Seward's Folly or Seward's Icebox. Johnson also took criticism for this event, even though his role was much more minimal in comparison to Seward. Critics of Johnson called the new territory Johnson's Polar Bear Garden and claimed that Johnson was giving Seward far too much power. Seward was laughed off the political stage for the remainder of the administration for making a land purchase that at the time was considered foolish. This is the area that President Kennedy would call the storehouses of the nation, rich in timber, rich in minerals, rich in fisheries, rich in water power, and rich in the blessings of liberty. In the end, Seward proved to be in the right when in 1898, gold was discovered. Over the years, many natural resources have been found in Alaska, paying off the Alaska Purchase many times over. Seward, like many leaders, took a risk, and the deal paid off. Seward retired from politics following the end of the Johnson administration in 1869. He moved back to Auburn, New York, where he died on October 10, 1872. I think he handled all that foreign policy very well, you know, in the midst of a civil war that, that needs even more attention, so I, I'd rank him one of the great secretaries of state. I think some people would say he might be uh, even uh, number one. Seward played a major role in his doings as a politician, and his actions had a lasting impact on the nation. Seward led the country into an era of progress and reform, dealt certainly with foreign nations, and was willing to take the risks that in the end resulted in great profit for the nation. Despite proving to be one of the greatest people to occupy the office of secretary of state, Seward is heavily forgotten by most Americans. While his policies affect our daily lives and the lives of every American, he is often overshadowed by larger figures in American history. Normally, leaders are the great men and women who have been characterized as well known by the people who succeed them. But Seward proves to be the flaw in this rule, showing how a character often made a side note in history could have such a lasting impact on the nation. Now is the time to rethink their rule, reanalyze the past, and recognize the greatness of those who have been left a side note in history.